Daniel chapter 1, this is what God's Word says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to, dis- to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat at the king's food be observed by you, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So we listened to them in this matter, and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Look at the screen here. We have a memory verse that uh, we want to have you learn for this sermon series. Let's say it together. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So... Oh, excuse me, 1 Peter 2.12, thank you. Um, no, this is important to reflect on because Peter here, he's talking to Gentiles and he's referring to everyone else as Gentiles also. So when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. What I want to try to impress upon you in this, this sermon is that we live among Gentiles. And uh, if I say anything that you disagree with in, in the sermon, I'd, I'd be interested to hear um, what your thoughts are on it too. So if you, if you disagree with something that I say here, please come and talk to me. I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to say. In American eyes, Christianity is increasingly irrelevant and extreme. There's a whole book that I've been 
reading recently that's on this very topic. For example, Christian leaders are not seen as relevant for public life. Only one out of six say that Christian leaders are very reliable guides for how Christianity should inform our political injustice systems. Christianity shouldn't inform our political injustice systems. Only 25% say ministers are very reliable in helping people live out their convictions privately and in public. Only that many, only 25%. There's a lot of people who think that faith organizations are not necessary for a charitable society. In other words, we could do away with all the faith organizations that are helping all kinds of people in need, and people would just help out anyways. That's not true, but it's what people think. Of those who claim no religion at all, three out of five think the most charitable work would continue without Christians at all. 17% of practicing Christians think this. So there's a perception here. Religion is not necessary for public good. That's a growing thought. Again, it's not true, but it's what more and more people are thinking. There's a lot of people who think you can live a good life without Christian faith at all. 75% agreed that a person can live a pretty good and decent life without being a Christian. We don't need Christianity to have a good life. That's a common perception. So, Christianity is irrelevant. It's also extreme in people's eyes. Three out of five say it's extreme to try to convert someone to your faith. Three out of five. That's 60% of all people. Half people say it's extreme to believe that sexual relationships between people of the same sex is morally wrong. Half. It's extreme to think that. 11% say it's extreme to read the Bible silently in a public place. 45% of non-religious agree that Christianity is extremist. One out of four non-religious millennials, that's born between 84 and 02, say the Bible is a dangerous book of religious dogma that has been used for centuries to oppress people. Christianity in people's eyes more and more is irrelevant and it's extreme. So if you call yourself a Christian, if Jesus is your Lord, then in this society, more and more, you are irrelevant and you are extreme. Daniel and his friends were taken, not voluntarily, they were taken to a far-off land where their faith was considered irrelevant and extreme. At the beginning of the chapter, it points out how Nebuchadnezzar came and captured Jerusalem. And he took the stuff from the temple of God and put it in the temple of his God. Maybe you noticed that. Yahweh, the God of Israel, lost to Babylon. Babylon's gods are better than Israel's God now because obviously your God can't protect your place and your temple articles are now in the temple of our God. So your God is irrelevant. It's useless. Our gods are bigger and better. Obviously. Israelite food restrictions. What is that about? If you, were, if you ate at the king's table and you ate the king's food, that was the, the best possible food that was produced in the whole kingdom of Babylon. Babylon was the world power at the time. So you had the best possible food pretty much in the world. And so Daniel and friends here, they're basically saying, no, no, that's okay. We, we'll, we'll have some other food instead. That's a pretty extreme. Another thing that happened to them, their names reflecting the true God were replaced with names 
from false gods. You notice there that they were renamed. Here's what those names mean. Daniel means God is my judge. He was named Belteshazzar, O lady, wife of Bel, one of their gods, protect the king. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. And that was changed to Shadrach, the command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael means who is what God is. Changed to Meshach, who is like Aku, the moon god. Azariah, Yahweh is helper. Changed to Abednego, servant of the shining one, that is Nebo. So your names, their names were changed after pagan gods. When you name somebody or name something, that's kind of saying indirectly that they belong to you. So imagine, let's just say, you're, imagine you're, you're a citizen of Jerusalem at this time. Imagine that. You're in Jerusalem. Here comes this big, powerful nation that comes, besieges your city, takes it over, overthrows the government, and decides that they're going to take some of your kids with them back to Babylon. You'll probably never see them again. Not only will you never see them again, they're going to be trained in pagan ways, in pagan schools, with pagan literature, eating pagan food in a pagan environment. Not only are you never going to see them again, but they are not going to be trained to know the true God anymore at all. And they were renamed. The names that you gave them, no longer called that anymore. Somebody else owns them now. And Daniel and friends, they were fed Babylon's best food. In the Hebrew there, it kind of says the king's delicacies is what it says. In other words, the best food that you could have. The king's delicacies. So in other words, you know how Jesus told us to pray, give us this day our daily bread? Well, their daily bread came from the king. They belonged to the king because the king renamed them and the king was feeding them. Their daily bread came from the king. So it's kind of like the king is their God now. And they were educated as Babylonians. It says in verse 5, teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. They were going to be trained as Babylonians. They were no longer going to be Israelites. So it's the idea here is that if you're conquering another nation and you want to take them over, you take the best of their students, their kids, and then you bring them to your country and you train them to be like you. So the best of them is now going to be like you. Babylon was determined to make them Babylonians. You are no longer Israelite. You are Babylonian now. You're going to be called by the names that we give you. You're going to be trained like we train people. And you're going to basically believe and act and live like you were one of us. You can forget about home. You can forget about whatever gods you used to serve. That God lost. You worship our gods now. Babylon determined to make them Babylonians. And Daniel and friends decide that they're going to draw a line. We're going to draw one line here. They weren't going to be victims in this whole scenario. Up until they draw a line on food, they're victims. They were taken. They were educated. They were renamed. And now they're drawing a line and saying, no, it's going to stop in one spot. Now Daniel and friends might have longed for the good old days, but those days were not good either. There was a reason why it says in verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And if you've ever read the books of the kings or the books of Chronicles, you know what I'm talking about. You know how even though Israel had autonomy, 
there was all kinds of idolatry that was going on there. People worship, tried to worship the, the true God and other gods at the same time. And they would even try to mix them up together so that they would take foreign pagan artifacts and put them in God's temple and they would try to blend that worship together. The good old days were really not that good. There was paganism infecting the true worship of God. And God finally says, you know what, I'm done with this. It had been going on for so long. I'm done with this. I'm giving you guys into their hands. We're kind of in a similar situation. We might long for the days when faith was a part of public life, but in those days, faith was rarely true faith in Christ. There was lots of syncretism going on back then. For example, Thomas Jefferson one of the main founders of our country, he was a deist. He didn't believe in miracles. He didn't believe in Jesus' resurrection. In fact, he took the Gospels and he cut them all apart and made his own set of Gospels about Jesus. I have his book on my shelf, actually. And he took out all the miracles and just left in Jesus' teachings because he thought Jesus was a good teacher. And he ends it when Jesus is buried. He didn't rise from the dead. George Washington is probably the founding father who may have been most admirable when it came come to faith. But if you read his biography, he was a master mason, which is basically a kind of a syncretistic blending of all gods together. I've toured a Masonic temple, and it's very much blending all the religions together. He never professed his personal faith, and he seems to have never taken communion. Excuse me, never professed his personal faith is from somebody else. He, George Washington, he served on the vestry of his parish, but he never took communion. Excuse me. In 1776, only 17% of people belonged to a church. Only 17%. Abraham Lincoln quoted the Bible in his speeches, but he never professed his personal faith. He never even talked about his own beliefs at all. He knew how to talk the talk. He knew how to use God to stir up the crowd and to get votes and to get approval, but he didn't actually believe it himself from everything we can tell. The United States actually really became religious after the Second Great Awakening. That was in the 1830s. And that, though, was emphasizing an instant salvation. You just pray this prayer and suddenly you're saved. And discipleship kind of went by the wayside. So forget about a church that builds you up in faith. You know, Jesus said, go and make disciples. In the second great awakening, it's just pray this prayer and then you're saved. And all this individualistic faith came out of that time. So a lot of people started belonging to a church after that, but they would split at the drop of a hat. That's when denominations started to just explode. And that's also when a bunch of cults started, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Then there's the 50s and 60s. I'm almost done for people who are sick of history here. In the 50s and 60s, that's when church attendance peaked. And, uh, you know, some of you were alive at that time and you remember those as maybe some good old days there, right? But that's around the time when the largest denominations in this country started to back off of their missionary work and they started to just move to political activism. There was a time when the President of the United States laid a cornerstone in a new headquarters of what was going to be called the Protestant Vatican in New York. And that was all of the denominations that were the ones to blaze the trail in liberalism. So the big churches that are today the most liberal ones out there were the ones that everybody was flocking to. American Christianity is not very Christian. 
Gallup would ask this question, do you believe in God? In 1953, 98% said yes. In 2011, it only dropped just a little bit to 92%. The people who say they believe in God today are almost the same as the people who back then. America's God really is secular humanism dressed as Christianity. In America, God wants us to feel good and get along, and that's it. That's America's God. So, if you want to think about what Americans, not only Americans, but American Christians think about God, look at some of these things. The best way to find yourself is by looking within yourself. 91% of American adults said, agreed with that. People should not criticize someone else's life choices. Jesus criticized other people all the time. 89% of that. To be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire most. 86% agreed with that. The highest goal of life is to enjoy it as much as possible. 84% said that. People can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. Not Christian at all. 79%. Any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. 69% agreed with that. And even the Christians in America, many of them agreed with this. None of these are biblical truths at all. In fact, they're quite opposite from many things that Jesus taught. But this is what American Christians, many of them, think. American Christianity is really just about feeling good and getting along with people. That's all God cares about, apparently. That's not the Bible. That's humanism. God is a God of good feelings and getting along. In verse 8, Daniel and his friends traded the best food for boring food. Now why would they do that? Of all the things that were going on and the changes that were, they were being made, this could be a whole other sermon. Why did they pick that, that one to draw the line on? Why didn't they say, you know what, I'm not going to be called by a pagan god. I'm going to keep my old name. Why didn't they draw the line there? I don't know. I mean, it's pretty obvious that they were not trying to keep kosher because wine was allowed and they decided they weren't going to drink the wine. And it's kind of pretty obvious that they weren't worried about the food being sacrificed to idols because the vegetables would have been offered to the idols too. The reason why they did this was because of one thing. They did this so that they would not become Babylonian. They wanted to draw one line to say, Babylon is not going to completely take us over. We are not going to become like you. God's laws would have allowed for a bunch of that food, maybe not all of it, but they didn't want to be Babylonian. So if Jesus is your Lord, then your allegiance is to Him. You belong to Him before you belong to anything else or anyone else. You follow Him more than you would follow anybody else. You obey His rule and law before you obey anything else. You are citizens of his kingdom before any other kingdom. The Bible says that people of faith are strangers and exiles on earth. We don't belong here. We think things that are entirely different than the people around us. If you believe what the Bible says, then you're not going to get along with people very well. They're going to think you're irrelevant, and they're going to think you're extreme. They're not going to like you. That's the same reason why they didn't like Jesus either. We disrupt the world's view of things. 
We are strangers and exiles on earth. In Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, it goes through all these people of faith in the Old Testament. It says, They all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For the people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land of which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. If you're a person of faith, then that would apply to you too. You are a stranger and an exile here. You do not belong to this country. You are longing for another one. Christians are strangers in the United States of America. This is not our true home. This is not our true kingdom. We, like to, we may like this country. We may value this country. And it might be the best place on earth to belong to. But it is not our kingdom. And it is not our home. We don't belong here. And we are irrelevant and extreme here. At least if you believe what the Bible says. If you believe what the Bible says, you do not believe what most people say. Look at the uh, screen here. Let's answer this together. What does the second request of the Lord's Prayer mean? Your kingdom come means rule us by your word and spirit in such a way that more and more we submit to you. Keep your church strong and add to it. Destroy the devil's work. Destroy every force which revolts against you and every conspiracy against your word. Do this until your kingdom is so complete and perfect that in it you are all in all. When we pray that Lord's Prayer together, we are praying for another kingdom. We're not satisfied with this one. We don't belong to this one. There's another one that we're looking forward to. So following Christ means not following the crowd. That means you are distinct from the rest. That means you are going to draw lines that you are not going to cross. Maybe even some lines that the Bible allows for. Daniel and his friends, they could have eaten at least most of that food, but they did not want to become like Babylon. At least not completely. They wanted at least something that they could hold on to. To be distinct. To be different. To say, we don't belong here. And I hope that we do the same. So what's something that you do that most everybody else does? What's something that you refuse to do that everybody else would do? Now, there's lines that you've drawn for yourself to make you distinct and different than the rest of this world. Because you don't belong here, and neither do I. Believing Christ's truth means there are popular beliefs that you oppose. If you believe that Jesus is telling the truth, and that He is the truth, then there's going to be popular beliefs that you do not agree with. And there's going to be things that you believe that everybody else disagrees with. For example, all roads lead to the same God. That's a common thought. It's a common belief. Especially right now. If you believe what Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, then you disagree with that. Or how about look within yourself for truth? That's a common belief, as we just saw. Even among people who call themselves Christians. I hope you realize that what the Bible says is that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Out of the heart come evil thoughts. These are what make a man unclean. Obeying Christ as king means sometimes disobeying other rulers. Now, fortunately in our country, most of 
the laws overlap with what God's laws are, most of them, much of the time, but not all of them, not all of the time. I hope you're willing and ready to disobey some of these laws because of Jesus Christ. For example, most people say, and there are some rules against sharing your faith in public. There's supposed to be certain places where we don't do that. But Christ's last command, His parting command was, go and make disciples of all nations. Not just converts, but disciples. And that's a command that we have to follow. Daniel and friends, they didn't revolt. They quietly remained distinct. They didn't try to change their government. They didn't try to overthrow the government. They didn't try to pick up arms and make everything different. They just quietly remained different. They realized that they couldn't change it, that they couldn't do anything about it. So they remained distinct. And they were probably thought irrelevant and extreme as just that food incident records. Yeah, if you eat just vegetables, you're going to be thin and weak. And I'm going to get in trouble. It might be easy to think that living for God means losing out. That it's not going to be as well for you. You're going to be thin and weak if you do what God says. You're going to be kind of a loser. You're going to be irrelevant. You're going to be extreme. It might be easy to think that. And you might miss some things. But whatever God tells you not to do or tells you to do that makes you irrelevant and extreme, that's going to be the better thing for you anyways. Whatever you're going to miss out on is not good for you. And they were perhaps thought extreme, but they were a blessing to Babylon. Babylon was a better place because of them. They were found to be ten times better than all of the magicians and enchanters that were found in the kingdom. Ten times better. Not just a little better, but ten times better. Babylon was better off because they were there. You can be extreme and irrelevant, and you can be a blessing to the place where you live. And that is what we as Christians are called to do. We're not called to make Babylon into Israel. We are called to be a blessing to Babylon. The United States of America may be the best of the Babylons, but it is still Babylon. So let's not feel too at home here. We can appreciate this place. We can appreciate the freedoms that we have, the prosperity, the wonderful things that this country brings, but let's not ever delude ourselves into thinking that we belong here or this is our home. This is not our home. If you believe Jesus and everything that He said, then you are at odds with this country and where it's going. It's where we live. It's not our home. This is Babylon, and Babylon wants to make us Babylonian. They want to make us like them. But Christians follow Christ. We live in a secular, humanistic environment. That's the air that we're breathing. That's the messages that we're receiving. And it's secular humanism that's dressed up sometimes as God. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to feel good. God wants you to make lots of money and be healthy all the time. God wants you to just get along with everybody and not make any waves ever. We are called to be holy. And we are called to follow Christ, who definitely disobeyed some of the rules and the laws that were at his time. But like Daniel and his friends, even though we might be considered extreme and irrelevant, we are going to be a blessing to this place. We are going to make this place better because we are in it. We are going to bring God to this place, the true God, not the God that people want. We are going to bring the true Christ to this place. Christians might be thought extreme, but they are always a blessing. 
We always bless those around us. We always benefit those people. As our memory verse says, so when they speak against you as evildoers, call you irrelevant and extreme, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He returns. That's our goal. We are like Daniel and his friends, and this is like Babylon. And our goal is to be a blessing to the people around us, to make this place better. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord our God in heaven, you've called us to be citizens of a kingdom that is coming. And Lord, as we follow you, we recognize that we are at odds with the people around us. And Lord, we don't really belong here, do we? We, Lord, are ready to serve you. We're ready to draw lines so that we can be distinct. And Lord, we're ready to serve you in whatever ways that we can to show love and to be a blessing. Please lead us to do that. In the name of Jesus, amen.